Uh, Nicole Perlroth covers cybersecurity and digital espionage for the New York Times. She's covered Russian hacks of nuclear power, power plants, airports, and electricity elections, North Korea's cyber attacks against movie studios, banks, and hospitals, Iranian attacks on oil companies, banks, and the Trump campaign, and hundreds of Chinese cyber attacks, including a month-long hack of the New York Times itself. Her new book, This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends, was praised by LitHub as stark, necessary, thoroughly reported reminder that no matter how strong the safe is, there will always be someone who can come along and crack it. Welcome, Nicole. We're excited to have you join us tonight. Thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you so much to the American Writers Museum. It's a real treat to be here, even virtually. Even virtually. Hopefully we'll have you in the museum at some point. Um, I, I just wanted to say how interesting and engrossing the book was for me. Um, I, I have, um, and I'm not, I'm, I'm going to point out that it is meant for a general audience. So you do not need an IT background to read this book at all. Um, but I did have an IT background um, in my past lives when I was a much younger person. Um, I was the network administrator for a company. And so I've dealt with uh, cyber attacks, ransomware, and things of that nature. So it was very painful to read this book and realize <laughs> just how scary things have gotten in the 20 years since, uh, or 20 plus years since I had that moniker as one of my titles. And so um, it's, it's an amazing book. It is somewhat scary, but a scary that I think everybody should read and, and understand um, as much as possible. Um, I'd like to start off with a few questions about the general nature of writing this book for you as a writer. Um, and uh, and then we'll get into a little more detail about, about the topic itself. But, um, you know, as I said, this is a book that's written for the general public um, to understand this very important topic. And you're a New York Times reporter who covers things for the general audience, but you didn't come into this with any special knowledge. Can you kind of talk about that notion of being a writer who gets a beat that does not match with your particular skill sets? Yes, so it's a funny story and I, I, I share it in the book in part because I want readers to start where I was 10 years ago, which was I knew nothing about cybersecurity. In fact, before I went to the New York Times, I'd been covering venture capital and startups at Forbes magazine. And it was about the time that Facebook was picking up and some of these VCs were becoming celebrities. And I was writing about them on the cover of Forbes magazine, people like Peter Thiel and household names now, but uh, weren't necessarily back then right away. And so the Times tech editor called me and he said, you know, we're looking at you for this job, but we're not sure you're going to want it. And I said, well, you're the New York Times, so I'll take whatever it is. How bad could it be? And he said, it's cybersecurity. And I just rolled my eyes and I said, not only do I not know anything about cybersecurity, but I've actively gone out of my way not to know anything about cybersecurity. He said, we'll still come, come to the interview. So I remember going to the New York Times, walking into the building and just telling myself to be myself. And one day I could tell my grandkids that the holy New York Times had invited me into the building. And over the course of the interviews, I even tried to tell the editors at the New York Times, listen, I know this person and this person and this person, they all cover cybersecurity. They're really great. You should bring them in. And the New York Times response was, we've interviewed those people and we had no idea what they were talking about. You're hired. <laughs> so, so began my illustrious entrance to the uh, New York Times. And since then, I have really seen my role as translator um, you know, as you mentioned, I really, ha uh, they threw me into the deep end because the Chinese did attack the New York Times um, mm -hmm. the second year I was there. And so I had the opportunity to embed with our network uh, security team and the FBI and Mandiant, which is a company that has now become a household name because they're the number one sort of ghostbusters that you call every time you're hacked. And that was really my first frontline experience into what it's like to get hacked and by a nation state and opened up my eyes to this new asymmetrical warfare where companies and journalists and dissidents and activists were all having to now think about defending themselves, not just from fraud and cyber criminals, but from nation states who wanted to read their communications or access their sources. And really, I think it ended up benefiting me that I didn't come into this with an IT background, because at the end of the day, my job is really to translate 
these threats for the everyday person. So I could go to my sources and say, read me back what you just told me, but explain it to me like I'm your seven-year-old daughter, because ultimately I'm going to have to turn it around and translate it for this lay audience. And so that's what I've done. Um, but what I saw over the last 10 years was that each of these attacks got a slight, just got slightly deadlier than the last. Um, and we haven't seen the sort of calamitous world ending cyber 9-11 hack that a lot of people warned me about when I was a green reporter 10 years ago at the Times covering this space. But when I looked around, what I saw was almost worse. And, and it's interesting to think about it in the pandemic because we aren't seeing the big boom, but what we're seeing is almost more like a plague where our intellectual property has been stolen. Russia has hacked our elections, our power plants, our nuclear plants. Mm -hmm. Iran has emerged as this did from this digital backwater into one of the most active adversaries we face. And cyber criminals are holding our hospitals and cities hostage with ransomware every day. And I felt like it needed a book to really put this all in a larger narrative that people could see um, all of these incidents that I was covering for the times in the context of where we came from and where we were going. That's um, you, you. You were just mentioning this notion of you know seeing the the idea for a book. Um, I'm curious from from a writing perspective. When did you decide that the book needed to be written? And how long did it take you to put this together? Because you interviewed close to 300 people, you said. Yeah, so there were a couple things. I mean, one, um, I was so green in this space when I got to the New York Times that I don't think I ever had the confidence to say, I'm going to write a book about this thing. But I started seeing people who went to the Wall Street Journal who were covering these topics and had started very green selling books. And then I would read the book and I would see myself all over the footnotes. <laughs> and so I had to sort of give myself this pep talk, like, you can do this, you know enough to write a book. And to me, um, the thing that really was not being explored was this invisible market for cyber weaponry and hacking tools that really was started in the United States, but was spreading to places like Abu Dhabi, um, where they were turning these tools, not on their adversaries or terrorists necessarily, but on their own people. And I was starting to meet those people. So that was one, one thing I, I always found fascinating and really sort of the, the, the biggest market you've never heard of, you know, was sort of my take on that. Um, the other thing was I really wanted to explore the incentive structures behind our vulnerability. I knew from being in Silicon Valley that businesses and, and individuals, we were all buying into this promise that Silicon Valley was delivering us of the promise of a frictionless society where we could access everything with our phones, not just Uber, but increasingly critical infrastructure, the power grid, water treatment facilities, you know, contractors wanted to access their temperature and pressure gauges and chemical levels remotely. Mm -hmm. And so we were sort of moving to this click button culture and I knew that that was also leading us to become one of the world's largest attack surfaces. And I also saw all of these nation states suddenly knocking on our doors um, and clearly showing the intent not just to hack American businesses, but to attack our critical infrastructure. And when I looked at what government was doing, there were two things that bothered me. One was any attempt to pass any legislation that just set mandatory levels of security for critical infrastructure operators was constantly getting knocked down by lobbyists or watered down to the point where they were just useless. And I, I knew also that the government had this other incentive, not necessarily to keep us safe, but in a lot of days when they found vulnerabilities in code that was making its way into our smartphones and our laptops, but also our critical infrastructure, because software was eating the world and making its way into so much of our water and power supply and pipelines. The US government, for a long time I knew, had a choice. If they found a vulnerability in Microsoft Windows, which goes into all of our critical infrastructure, they could turn it over to Microsoft to fix it and patch it and roll it out into a software update so that we would all be safer for it. Or they could hold on to it 
and they could hold on to it to use to spy on terrorists or on uh, Russian officials at the embassy in Kiev or in Jalalabad, um, or in the case they might need to drop a cyber weapon on someone else's critical infrastructure one day. So I was fascinated by this moral hazard of, are we keeping, are we keeping Americans safe or are we just all headed down this road of fur further vulnerability? And so that's the part of the market I really wanted to dig into was the incentive structures and in particular, this moral hazard that government had created around whether to keep these vulnerabilities secret or turn them over and get them patched. Interesting. The um, Some of what you brought up, um, you know, there's a term within the book um, that's used regularly and you explain it well. And I think for a lot of people watching, they may not know what a, a zero day um, piece is. Can you, can you kind of explain what a zero day is and, and how that is such a part of our day to day lives and how it creates these opportunities for nation states and for others uh, to have this weaponry? Yeah, and I promise this is the most technical part of the book is just understanding what a zero day is. I really did write this for my mom and for my friends so they could understand what the hell I've been doing for the last 10 years. But a zero day is just a vulnerability in some code. So let's just use the example of your iPhone. If I, a hacker, find an error in your iPhone's iOS software and I know how to exploit it, that is I know how to write the code that could be used to read your text messages or turn on the audio on your iPhone or record your camera without you knowing, that kind of thing, or track your location, um, I have a choice. I can call Apple and say, hi, I'm a hacker. I just found a major zero day in your iOS software. And Apple can patch that and roll it out in your software updates. And this is why it's important for you to roll out your, to update your software. Um, or these days I can sell it to a government agency, a spy agency, or one of their brokers. And the going rate for that capability, the ability to access your iPhone remotely is $2.5 million in the US and $3 million if I wanna sell it to the United Arab Emirates or, or Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. So um, these are, these are, this is good money that I can get from from selling it to government players whose interest in not, is not in telling Apple, hey, fix this zero day. It's, I'm going to use this for espionage. Um, and increasingly these other governments, the ones I just mentioned, you know, we all saw what happened with J Jamal Khashoggi. Um, I was seeing what was happening with Emirati dissidents and just people who were critical of the monarchy on Twitter. They were getting tracked and beat up and People were hacking into their baby monitors. And so this was the power of a zero day. And um, that's that's what it is. And it, it has created this gi gigantic market, not just one that's been in the US for a long time, but also in these other countries that don't have the same red tape and human rights track records as we do here. And so when, you're, when you were structuring this book, um, I'm kind of curious because in going through it, you, you're covering a, a broad span of time. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're, but you don't necessarily take us through a chronological story. You mm -hmm. seem to have structured it around certain people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, you've got stuff that comes up in the 1950s and the Cold War, um, and then you're in 2017 and 2019 and, and pretty much up to the present day in some of the, uh, epilogue and some other places. So I'm, I'm curious, um, when you were structuring this story or, or this book, did you look at it as why were the individuals so important to tell the story? And mm -hmm. why did you structure it around them instead of, you know, around here's how it started and here's where we're at? Yep. So for me, I really wanted to take the readers by the hand mm -hmm. and put them in my shoes when I was just starting out at the times hearing murmurings of this market. And then, so I became sort of chapter one, you know, the journalist. Um, and it describes my own sort of eye-opening moments in discovering that there was a market for vulnerability that in large part, the American taxpayer was funding this market 
Um, and just, I was fascinated by that idea that we, the American taxpayer was funding this market that led to more vulnerability for ourselves. Um, the next chapter, you know, each chapter, I wanted it to be about one human that symbolized a slice of this market. And so if I represent sort of the, the outsider, mm -hmm. then I had one hacker I call Zero Day Charlie who wanted to drag this market out into the light. I have one chapter about a broker uh, who sat down with me and unfortunately I couldn't use his real name because a lot of these programs are closely protected and now these days classified, who walked me through the early days of this market when the U.S. first started paying hackers to turn over these zero days in code and how they were getting used. Um, I Then the biggest challenge of the book was trying to get inside the NSA. Um, right. And I was really worried about that when I signed on to do this book. And I didn't know how I was going to tackle it. I had been given some access to the Snowden document. So I had a little bit uh, more of an inside take than the average journalist would but I really wanted to tell it through a person's eyes. And so the luckiest sort of serendipitous moment in researching this book was sitting at my cubicle at work. Um, woe is me about the fact I, I was never going to get inside the NSA's head on this. And my coworker who used to cover cybersecurity at the Times for a long time, John Markoff said, oh, you should just talk to the godfather of cyber war. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he's never talked to me, but maybe he talked to you. And he gave me his name. His name was Jim Gosler. And I cold called him one day. And I said, I'm writing this book about cyber arms and the market for cyber arms and how these programs started at the, in the U.S. government. And he walked me through um, the early days of the market. And, and he explained that this actually started in the Cold War. Uh, with a hack of American typewriters at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow when the NSA discovered that the Soviets were planning a tiny little implant in the back coil of a typewriter that could measure the slightest magnetic disturbance in the Earth's uh, mag magnetic field, catalog it, and then was sending it, were sending it by radio to a radio unit that they had buried in the embassy chimney that we found later. And he basically said that was our big wake-up call. That's when we realized that unless we hacked into and implanted ourselves in every new technology that came on the market, we were not only going to lose the Cold War, because by the time they found that, the Soviets had been reading our unencrypted typewriter communications for seven or eight years, um, but we were basically going to lose the spy games. And so that was the moment when the NSA started pouring substantial resources into digital exploitation programs. And there was a lot he couldn't talk about because it was classified, uh, but there was a lot I was able to work around with my access to the Snowden documents. And I told that slice through his eyes. So the book does jump back in time. Mm -hmm. um, and then it jumps forward again to these factories that have essentially popped up around the beltway uh, where these hackers have left the agency and now find that they can make more money and deal with far less bureaucracy by developing these zero days into click and shoot tools and selling them back to the agency. And then later it's, you know, American hacker gets poached by a Beltway contractor that's not in the Beltway, but is in Abu Dhabi. And they're working on behalf of the United Arab Emirates. And where do those programs go? So I really tried to structure it, at least for the first two thirds of the book, that each chapter was through the eyes of one person who symbolized a slice of this market. And it's been funny because I thought the people who I used for to tell those stories would be um, feel a little have have mixed feelings about being featured in this book. Um, but it turns out that since the book has come out, people have just been coming out of the woodwork. Hey, why'd you use him and not this other factory that's been selling zero days to the, you know, <laughs> Indian government for the last 10 years, you know, so it's, I, I'll have to write another book with just the, um, emails <laughs> I've gotten over the last two weeks. So, yeah. Well, that's interesting. You, um, as, as you were talking about this, the, there's a chapter, um, that you call the Rubicon. And I think that, you know, for, for a lot of us, when we read about these things in the news, we don't necessarily understand. And so we may gloss over the story. Mm 
and and the Rubicon is a, is a very interesting chapter because you don't actually talk about the illusion of what is the Rubicon and Caesar and and you know turning away. We all we know what the phrase means in general, but mm-hmm. um, you know it is very much a, a military phrase about committing yourself to something that is changing the world. And so, can you talk a little bit about that story because I think mm-hmm. that you know where it rests in the book and what it's saying is we went from a whole bunch of people just making hacks and and trying different things to something that was so coordinated and terrifying Mm -hmm. um and and that we did it you know the united Mm -hmm. states did this yes so the rubicon chapter deals with a computer worm called stuxnet and the the code name inside the agencies was olympic games and it was fascinating carrie to go back to that period in u.s history which feels weird to call it history because it was 2006. Mm -hmm. But um, just to go back to where we were, we were in the second W administration. The um, body counts coming back from Iraq were reaching their highest point. We were also in Afghanistan. The tolerance and appetite to stay in these wars um, was lessening. And Israel was knocking on our door saying, give us your bunker buster bombs. We want to bomb Natanz, which was the Iranian nuclear facility where they were enriching their uranium. And at that point, um, George W. Bush basically had zero interest in getting into a third war in the Middle East. Every Pentagon simulation that they did showed that even if we just gave Iran our bunker buster bombs, which is what it would have taken to essentially blow up Natanz because the facility itself is just built under underground under so much cement um, that their jets alone wouldn't do it. And so every simulation we did show that America would be dragged into World War III. And not only that, but we, we might lose uh, because we were so overstretched in the Middle East. So uh, he said, get me a third option. And Keith Alexander, who was then the director of the NSA, came back with the third option. And the third option was, we think we can use zero days, essentially. We think we can break in to Natanz, which is an air gap facility, meaning it's not connected to the internet. So we were going to have to do that by planting a spy or paying someone off. But we think we can get into, if we can get into Natanz, we think we can use a cyber attack, a computer worm, to get into the computers that control the rate at which the rotors spin these centrifuges. And that is the most fragile part of uranium enrichment. In fact, 10% of uh, centrifuges have to be thrown out every year in the enrichment process because it is such a fragile process. So he said, basically, I think if we can get into the computers that control those speeds, we could speed them up or slow them down And we could do it in a way that it looked like a natural accident. And we could basically decimate Iran's uh, uranium supply and set their programs back years. And it would be enough to get Israel off our back. And it was really interesting to talk to NSA hackers on the ground at Fort Meade during that time, because they described the Israeli pressure campaign as a PSYOP, which means a psychological operation. They were showing up, dumping documents, you know, on their desks saying, look, Here's where their uranium enrichment levels are. Here's where they need to be to get the bomb. They're going to get there. We have to do something. And it was pretty intense. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing they did, I learned, was they started sending these test flights. their are F-16s and helicopters on these test flights to Greece. And that was not a coincidental distance. The distance from Tel Aviv to the Acropolis was the exact distance from Tel Aviv to Natanz. Mm-hmm. So the pressure was, was going up. Uh, We knew we might have this third option. Bush gave it a go. And a few months later, um, I think it was Keith Alexander and and some of the other officials dropped this broken centrifuge on Bush's desk. (laughs) And he said, we we think we've done it. But we also we had to bring in the Israelis because we had to show them that that this was going to be the way that we were serious, we're taking seriously the threat of, of an Iranian bomb um, and also give them a stake in this. So together with the Israelis, that's what we did. We, we don't know who did it. We don't know who brought it in, mm-hmm. but we know 
that was a joint U.S. Israeli operation where someone carried a USB stick into Natanz, put it in a computer inside the facility, and there went the worm into the computers that controlled the, the centrifuges. And it was brilliant. It would once it found the centrifuges, it would wait 13 days just to make sure it was on the right system. Then it would speed up some of the centrifuges and then it would sit back for 27 days and then it would slow down a few of the centrifuges and then it would sit back for 27 days. And then all the while there was this mission impossible oceans 11 element to this whole thing where the engineers at Natan staring at their computers, everything seemed to be going smoothly, but through these videos uh, that uh, the atomic energy inspectors had planted outside Natan's, we knew that they were increasingly carting out their centrifuges, that they could see that the centrifuges were essentially not working anymore. And in 2010, we don't know how, but the worm got out. It escaped the facility. We still don't know how. And it basically circled the globe. It didn't do anything uh, because it had been designed clearly with some NSA lawyers standing over these coders' shoulders, uh, making sure that the code would only attack this exact configuration of centrifuges at Natanz. But it showed up at, at Chevron in the US. It showed up at companies all over Asia and the Middle East. And it was only a matter of time before governments and Iran and security researchers all over the world dissected it and realized that this was a worm that was designed very specifically for uh, Iran's uh, Natan's nuclear facility. And once the cat was out of the bag, uh, it opened up all these other governments' eyes to the power of a zero day, not just for espionage, but for destruction. And also we did cross the Rubicon. You know, we were the first government with Israel to essentially set the bar (laughs) in this other place, which made it okay for a foreign nation to get into another country's nuclear plant and take out its centrifuges so long as it did so with code. And so since the day that that worm has been, was discovered in 2010, we have seen the zero day market explode not just for zero days to spy on your iPhone, although that is the one that commands top dollar still, but we've seen a market for vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure like Schneider Electric software and Siemens software, the the software that really is designed for critical infrastructure. And we've seen Russia um, use those vulnerabilities to dismantle the safety locks at a chemical plant. Uh, you know, the last step you would need to do before triggering an explosion. We've seen Iran get into and poke around our dams. Fortunately, it was the wrong dam. They, they got into the Bowman Dam. There are two, mo- two Bowman Dams in the United States. One of them is a giant dam in Oregon that holds back a tsunami's worth of water. The other is this tiny little dam uh, in Westchester County, New York, that holds back a babbling brook. And fortunately, the Iranians were in the tiny babbling brook dam. But we've seen these capabilities um, start showing up in attacks back on American infrastructure. And, and you could argue that in many ways, we sort of opened, opened the door to these attacks. And, and recently, you know, I was thinking about it as I was going through the book and, and we were seeing what was happening in Texas, which had nothing to do with a hack, but that is the type of thing, you know, that, you know, what what we did there opened the door, as you said, for people to get into all kinds of facilities and mm-hmm. attack not just a computer network, but then the mm-hmm. devices attached to it and, and the target of infrastructure. You know, with the right hack, you could just have done something even much worse than what happened mm-hmm. in Texas. You yeah, could- it was it's really interesting watching Texas from a cyber vantage point, because the attack we worry about most is the one that takes out the power or contaminates the drinking supply. And that is exactly what we have been watching playing out in Texas and exactly what a cyber attack like that would look like. And it turned out it was just, you know, the impact of underinvestment in winterizing, Mm -hmm. but it is a very, very clear image of what one of these attacks would look like. And, and along that line, you, you talk about Ukraine in the beginning and then later in the book, you kind of start there and, and, no, don't end there, but you, you look at it a couple of times and in and, and what happened in 2017 as something that, you know, again, 
reading the news. I had a sense of, you know, something that happened mm -hmm. in Ukraine in a hack. But can you talk a little bit about just how bad that was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were, so there were three attacks um, starting in late 2015. For the first time, Russia pulled off an attack on Ukraine's critical infrastructure that took out the power um, in the middle of winter. They did it for six hours in Western Ukraine, but it shut off you know, power and heat and lights to something like 200,000 of uh, Ukrainians. And then they did it again a year later, but this time it was in Kiev, the nation's capital. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was short lived. And, but then they did this third thing in 2017. They used, well, I should back up and just say sometime in 2016, someone, we still don't know who they are, showed up on Twitter. They called themselves the shadow brokers and they claimed to have attacked or hacked the NSA. And for the next few months, they started dribbling out the NSA's stockpile of zero day exploits. And in 2017, they dumped the one that I was told was the crown jewel of some of the NSA's espionage programs, a zero day exploit called Eternal Blue mm -hmm. that used Microsoft, uh, a vulnerability in Microsoft Windows to essentially spread spyware or malware um, throughout servers automatically. Instead of, instead of having to go server to server manually, you could just detonate your spyware automatically. Now we used it for espionage and I was told that we were using it for some of the be best counterintelligence we got at the agency. But once it was dumped online in 2017, North Korea picked it up and they bolted it onto ransomware and they sent it around the world and it got into hospitals in the, in the UK um, law firms all over the country. Uh, and fortunately, they've been a little bit sloppy with the code. So it was able to be neutralized pretty quickly. But a month later, Russia picked it up for this famous attack on Ukraine in 2017. They used the NSA's tool and they detonated uh, the equivalent of ransomware, except there was no way to actually pay a ransom. So it was really just a destructive mm -hmm. attack on Ukrainian government agencies. And it really paralyzed Ukraine. People could not uh, pay for gas at gas stations. They couldn't get money out of ATMs. Uh, it caused uh, their uh, post service and their railways to be paralyzed. But it also hit any business that even had a single employee working from Ukraine. So Pfizer uh, was hit. A Tasmanian Cadbury chocolate factory in Tasmania was hit. Uh, and uh, Merck famously was hit. That year, uh, the, that attack decimated uh, its vaccine production lines. So it actually had to tap into the CDC's emergency stockpile of Gardasil vaccines that year. So it caused all kinds of destruction, partly with stolen NSA zero day exploits. And um, when I went to Ukraine, uh, I went two years after the attack. I would have gone sooner, but I had gotten pregnant and had a baby. <laughs> so by the time I got to Ukraine, it was two years later and s things were still not back up to where they were. Um, they were still figuring out how to eradicate some of this ransomware from their railway systems. Um, the post service had just lost all their records of where to ship what, um, I even went out and met with a man who worked at Chernobyl, the old nuclear site, where the attack had taken out the systems they used to monitor radiation levels uh, there. And so they, they were still using uh, manual uh, radiation monitors walking around um, the nuclear exclusion zone with these handheld radiation monitors. So people were still de dealing with the impact two years later, but I went and I met with everyone that had investigated the attack. And what they said to me was terrifying. What they said was, um, listen, everything we know, we know that we are basically Russia's test kitchen for these attacks. But when you go through the forensics, what you see is someone basically using the scientific method, testing one capability here, testing another there, um, occasionally turning off the lights, but only for six hours. We actually think that this attack that I just described um, was their final cleanup. Uh, they wanted to clean up after all of the experimenting they had been done on our systems. 
And we believe that we are not the end target here. We think you are. And we think this, this was all just a test run for some future attack on the United States. So that was terrifying to hear, especially from my vantage point, because I had covered all of these incursions we were picking up by Russian hackers into American critical infrastructure, electrical utilities, gas pipelines, energy companies. And we didn't really know what they were doing at first. We thought, okay, maybe and uh, maybe Russia is trying to steal our intellectual property because their economy is so dependent on oil and gas. You know, maybe they're trying to diversify here. But increasingly, it was becoming clear that these this was the preliminary stages for some future attack. And what the Ukrainians were saying is, if you don't pull your head out of the sand, um, you're you're going to see this kind of attack. But when it comes to you it's going to be so much worse because here we're not that digitized. You know, we haven't digitized our elections. Um, you know, yes, they were able to turn off the lights, but we haven't baked all this vulner this vulnerable software into our hospitals. Um, you know, when it comes your way, it could be a lot worse because you are just so much more wired. Yeah. And that I thought was very scary. The notion of just how, uh, I think you called it an attack surface area or, or something, you know, that, Everything the world's greatest off. attack surface. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We, we connected everything. And um, it's interesting, you know, I've, I'm going to kind of jump back a little bit to the notion of you writing this book and trying to reach people. Um, and, and just something that came to me as you were talking about translating this for folks. Um, you, English is not your first language, correct? Oh, did you see my tweet on this? So I, I um okay no so it is but um, when I was two when I first started mm -hmm. speaking my dad was a professor of medicine and we would go on sabbatical okay. um, every few years and so when we when we were living in Paris um, so my first words were things like parapluie and <laughs> merci but no I mean I I just mentioned that because one of the criticisms in, of the book mm -hmm. was that um, someone said it was uh, uh, too U.S. centric. And it, it ignored the Europeans and was someone even used the word xenophobic to Europeans, which I didn't even know was a possibility of something. Could, anyway, yeah. so I mentioned I had to laugh when I read that because I am a Dutch dual citizen mm -hmm. and uh, we lived we spent so much of my childhood in Europe. And um, most of my uh, my mom is Dutch and my dad's whole family is from Poland. But, uh, I thought that was funny that somebody was pointing that out. And uh, and so but you you are translating that world for a lot of people right now. Um, you are are looking at this. I'm curious, um, as you as the 10 years have gone by that you've been covering this, have you gone from, you know, you, you're obviously not the neophyte that you were um, when you started this process. You obviously know a ton about it and you're being referenced in other people's books. So I, I wonder, have you delved into it yourself? Have you learned to code? Have you sat down and hacked with people, you know, what, where have you gone in this process to get a better understanding? So I'm embarrassed to say, I still don't code. Um, but I've definitely looked over people's shoulders mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of the time. I mean, one of the first things I did at the times when I got there was I met a hacker named HD Moore, who's a legend in this space. And mm -hmm. I said, show me the lay of the land. Um, what should I be writing about? What are the things that we should be concerned about that no one is paying attention to? And he said, video conferencing, which is so funny now that we're on Zoom. <laughs> but this was 10 years ago. He said, video conferencing. Everyone has these video conferencing systems in their boardrooms and their hospitals and VC firms, law firms. And no one realizes that they haven't put these behind a firewall and they're not set up with a password. Of course, now 10 years later, we learned what Zoom bombing was. Right. But that's essentially what he was describing. And so he 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 and I, he gave me this little virtual web tour where he showed me, like, here's how you get on to this slice of the Internet, essentially, where you can find these open systems just sitting out there and mm. you can just click on them and you can see whatever they see. And these video conferencing systems are so high def. He at one point showed me how you could zoom into a room and onto a term sheet that was sitting on the table and a, to a window and across a parking lot where a squirrel was burrowing in the dirt. Um, and so I was doing a lot of that kind of thing where I, I was basically getting tutored 
in the capabilities and the vulnerabilities that hackers exploit. And these days, I still am learning. I still feel very green. I still have imposters uh, complex in this space. Um, but I try to think of it as an asset because I do think the minute you know the lingo a little too well, um, you stop translating it as well. So, you know, I, I kind of like where I am, where I don't know how to code. Maybe when I finally get out of cybersecurity, I'll finally learn to code. But no, I don't. Okay, I was just curious. The um, I'm going to um, take us a, a move over. We've got some questions from the audience in our Q&A. Um, and uh, so I'd like to pick up a couple of those. Uh, first one here is from Joel Jastrom. Hi, Joel. Um, should there be a mandate that cybersecurity firms share hacks and how they were done? I, yes, I mean, not just cybersecurity firms, but government. Um, there's a big discussion right now about threat sharing. And uh, it was made a little bit more complicated after Snowden, because for a long time, the government had said basically that the most data that we see now is not at the NSA. It's Google, it's Amazon Web Services. I mean, these are really the new front line for seeing these threats um, and malware and intrusions play out. So for a long time, the government was demanding better threat sharing. And then after Snowden and those leaks, the last thing Google wanted was any kind of mechanism for real-time threat sharing with the United States government because foreign governments were so appalled at the level of access that the Snowden documents appeared to show and the level of collaboration that it appeared to show between industry and the NSA. So it was a thorny issue for some time, but as the attacks have gotten worse and worse, there has been more and more calls and demand for better threat sharing. And this isn't your data threat sharing. This is um, you know, the IP addresses and the techniques and the malware strains that security firms, but also Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon, et cetera, are picking up and what the NSA is picking up. So we have seen better information sharing. Um, one of the things that's getting discussed more and more now, especially after this latest Russian hack on federal IT systems, the one they're calling SolarWinds because it came in, uh, Russians hacked a company called SolarWinds and used it to get into SolarWinds client systems through their software update. Um, one of the things that was just discussed this week in, in some of the Senate hearings about this was mandatory notification laws, um, because basically what they were saying was, you know, if if solar winds had been better set up to catch this mm -hmm. um, earlier and told uh, the U.S. government, but also Microsoft and FireEye, then maybe we wouldn't have had to wait nine months until FireEye discovered it had been hacked. FireEye is a major security company yeah. um, and could have the government agencies could have found out they were being hacked. So this is a big topic for discussion. And the problem is um, any talk of mandatory requirements on this, companies are usually so reticent to admit that they've been hacked because they're worried about class action lawsuits and their stock price dropping, that a lot of times it creates this perverse incentive where they will design their system so they don't pick up whether they have been hacked, so they don't have to notify anyone about it. So it, it should be done. I, I think it, we do need better notification and threat sharing, but it needs to be done in a way that we're not creating this perverse incentive for them to not look at whether um, they have been hacked or what they're seeing. Yeah, and you mentioned in the book too, on the uh, somewhat on that note, of uh, this notion that the zero days themselves that you know, obviously in this market of, of all the nation states and the other people who are buying them and, and picking them up that, you know, and it goes back to that Rubicon one is what I'm thinking about is, you know, the, the NSA held on to that because they were working on it for such an important project. Mm -hmm. But as you said, that started in 2006, Bush mm -hmm. handed it to Obama and mm -hmm. it happened under Obama that everything mm -hmm. continued. And then in 2010, it got picked up. But mm -hmm. if someone else had found that particular zero day mm -hmm. and figured out mm -hmm. a way to utilize it, you know, somebody could have been hurt. And mm -hmm. and so you mentioned, I think, the idea of a shelf life um, for mm -hmm. how long the NSA holds on to something before telling a company to patch it. You know, I mean, there's a lot of different issues at play here. 
Yeah, it's a really complicated set of issues too. And I don't claim to have all the answers, but one of the reasons I wrote this book was I felt like these solutions were being discussed in classified corridors and in the information security community. Um, and even some, in some cases, these conversations were being led by companies that sell zero day exploits for a living. So mm -hmm. we were really sort of delegating these conversations to those government agencies and industry players that had the least incentive to actually fix this thing. And from my perspective, I, I don't think we should immediately turn over every zero day the US government finds to Microsoft, because first of all, we have a process actually, it's called the vulnerability equities process in government, where anytime we find a zero day, we pull in representatives from various US government agencies and just sit around a table, or at least they used to before the pandemic, mm -hmm. to debate the merits of whether to keep a zero day or turn it over. No one in Iran is sitting around a mahogany table <laughs> debating whether to turn a zero day that they discover over to Microsoft or not. So at least we have a process. And what we were told was the process was this, how widely used is the software that's vulnerable? If it's more widely used by Americans, then we'll be more incentivized to turn it over to the company. Um, how easy would it be for another adversary or cyber criminal to find this zero day? And if it's easy, we'll turn it over to a US government agency. And how damaging would this be in the adversary's hands? Um, and if it would be very damaging, that would uh, err on the side of disclosure. And also would it harm uh, the government's relationship with industry if it, if it was discovered that we held on to this? So those were the criteria. But what happened was when the shadow brokers hacked the NSA, we still don't know who they are again, mm -hmm. and dumped this exploit online in Microsoft software in 2017 that was picked up by North Korea and then Russia, everything we had been told about this criteria for supposedly deciding whether to keep or turn over a zero day was a lie. When you just look at that single exploit, they had held on to it for more than five years. It was in Microsoft uh, Windows software, which is the most widely used software on the market today. We knew that it was incredibly dangerous. We called it phishing with dynamite. When I went back and talked to NSA hackers who used it during the period we were using it, they said, first of all, it was getting some of the best counterintelligence we were getting. So we never seriously considered turning this over to Microsoft, but we also called it phishing with dynamite because we knew if or when it was finally discovered by an adversary, it could be used for ransomware attacks or a destructive attack like the one we ended up seeing by Russia on Ukraine that boomeranged all around the world. So at the end of the book, I say, okay, listen, I'm not expecting that we should turn over every zero day we find, but we have done research on this. We know what the average length of time it takes to discover a zero day or for someone else to discover a zero day. And it's something like a year. So let's not hold on to it for more than a year, especially if it's in a widely used software like Microsoft, especially if we know it could be dynamite in the hands of an adversary. But these are really nuanced, difficult discussions. And it's usually one of those things where, um, you know, if it's really difficult to exploit, then maybe we could justify holding on to it longer for our own purposes, mm -hmm. usually espionage. But um, you know there needs to be more transparency around these issues. And I really think it's going to take the everyday person understanding what's at stake so that we can come up with creative solutions to these really complicated problems. And we're not just delegating it to the spies um, and battlefield operators and companies that sell these tools for a living. Um, that's uh very interesting, and I, I want to get to a couple more of these. Um, uh, Lori Howick is asking, have you felt at risk or threatened since starting this beat and or since the book came out? Yeah, so um, doing the book in the research phase, I describe this one, well, I describe a few things. One, at one point I got a security alert from our team at the New York Times saying someone is on the dark web, offering good money to anyone who can uh, hack into your phone or your computer. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not, um, not, that didn't feel good. 
Um, and I have, I'm very paranoid about using two factor authentication and I use signal the encrypted messaging apps to communicate with my sources and I'll take my most sensitive communications offline completely or as much as I can in the pandemic. Um, I did have one incident I describe in the book where I went down to Argentina uh, to meet with a lot of hackers who were selling to these zero days to governments, uh, many of them not uh, the United States government agencies or even our allies, but in some cases, other governments we would consider our adversaries. And I was asking a lot of hard questions uh, while I was there. And I did come home one night and find that um, my door was open and the safe where I'd put my laptop and thank God it was a burner laptop I'd brought uh, because I wasn't going to bring my own uh, down there uh, was open and the laptop had been put in a different position and the cash that I'd taken out from the Quavo was still sitting on the table. So it wasn't like a thief and they didn't bother taking the computer. So I assumed that someone had tried to tamper with the computer Um, But it was interesting that they'd gotten into the safe and not closed it again. So I thought maybe they're just trying to send me a message. Um, So I threw it in a, I I put it in the little bathroom garbage can, went down to the lobby and threw it in the trash. (laughs) And that was kind of my one really kind of terrifying moment. Um, And I've gotten those alerts. I I have advanced uh, email protection and I've gotten alerts from time to time that said, you know, a state sponsored hacker is trying to access your account, that kind of thing. But the worst part of my job, and I knew this when I was going to write a book about this, is there is a very critical information security community that will beat you senseless (laughs) if you don't describe things with the utmost technical diligence and accuracy that they deem, you know, accurate, which ultimately leads you to a place where the average reader can't understand uh, what you're saying. So that has always been the hardest tightrope that I walked. And I knew this book, I knew I was going to get it when this book came out. Um, In fact, it took me seven years because sometimes having these people that I see on Twitter yelling at me and harassing me on Twitter would cause so much writer's block. I would just have to step back from my computer for months at a time. And lo and behold, the book came out a few weeks ago had these rave reviews in the New Yorker and the New York times and lit hub and all these great places, places I respect tremendously. But this week, Oh, the reviews came from the technical community, you know, calling out, you know, the technical wording, um, saying things like I shouldn't have said that the NSA hacked into Google servers that I should have said they sniffed unencrypted traffic between data centers, you know, and things like, that is a legitimate criticism. And I flagged it to the publisher to have them fix in the next run. Yeah. But then it took a, an uglier note with the, this book is xenophobic to Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> so, which was the last thing I expected. So just today, uh, a few hours ago, I finally just put up the white flag on Twitter. And I said, it's been a great 13 years on Twitter, but I'm signing off for good. There's just been too much, too much of this. And it was quite liberating. Oh, wow. So, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say that you're leaving Twitter, but I can understand why. <laughs> you can find me on, you find me on the New York Times. <laughs> um, the, uh, another question here, how often um, do you think these nation states flex their capabilities rather than consider an actual attack? Oh, most of the time, I don't know about flexing actually. That's a really good question and it's an interesting word. I mean, I think where we are, where we're approaching Um, Well, this is interesting. Okay, so we know that Russia has probed our critical infrastructure. We know they've gotten into our power systems. And and we think it is preparation, preparatory. You know, should there ever be the geopolitical trigger, they would be in our power systems to turn off the lights and shut off our communication channels. So um, a couple of years ago, my colleague David Singer and I uh, broke the story that U.S. Cyber Command, in part, to retaliate for some of these attacks on our grid by Russia, but also in part to retaliate for the 2016 election interference, um, that they, that we had started hacking the Russian grid and making a very loud show of it. Usually the NSA and cyber command are quite quiet until they don't need to be quiet anymore. But in this case, we were told that we were being quite noisy with these hacking operations. And in fact, when David, my colleague, went to the National Security Council just before we published, uh, 
to say, you know, what we usually do, we do this all the time. Sometimes people have conspiracy theories about this, but we always go to the government agencies we write about to say, hey, we're about to report this, 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 and this. Let us know if anything is inaccurate. Let us know if, you know, what your side of the story is here and give us a comment. And usually with these stories, we have these very complicated, painful conversations. Sometimes they tell us we'll have blood on our hands. Um, sometimes it's, you know, there are things that they just don't, there might be some sentence for whatever reason they think might disclose some sensitive operation somewhere and they want us to take it out. And we always entertain those conversations. But this time when we're about to report that cyber command is hacking into the Russian grid, making a loud show of it, um, the National Security Council spokesman said, we have no problems with you publishing this story. <laughs> and what that told us was we were flexing. You know, we were making it clear that if Russia should do anything here, we mm. could do it right back to them. And it was sort of this digital version of mutually assured destruction. Other government agencies, I mean, it's clear that they are testing their capabilities. Like I mentioned, the, uh, the Iranian hack uh, on the dam where they were in the wrong dam. We don't know whether, you know, if they had been in the other Bowman Dam, they were actually going to unleash the gates at that dam, which would have caused the equivalent of a terrorist attack. Or if they were sort of scanning around, saw that this one dam was online, that they could get in, poke around, learn about the systems. Um, we don't know if it was sort of exploratory um, or more flexing, you know, as you, as you say. And then uh, another question here from Shante. Uh, um, from a business perspective, and this is this is a good question because I, I was just working on our annual insurance. Um, is cyber liability insurance worth the investment given the policy, policy oh. can often be complex and the claims difficult to prove? Yeah, so this is such an interesting one. This is the only case maybe where I find insurance just fascinating. So for a long time, the problem with cyber insurance was you could not get enough to actually cover the cost of the entire cyber attack. Target, when it was hacked, um, I learned they had a hundred million dollar, I think it was, don't don't quote me on that, a hundred million dollar insurance policy, but they couldn't get all of that coverage from one insurer. They had to go piecemeal and sort of cobble together this policy of $10 million each um, in coverage from different insurers. And it still was nowhere near uh, the amount it, they needed to, to cover the cost of that attack, which was aimed at uh, stealing people's credit card information. Um, so that's one thing to take into account. Sometimes it's just hard to get the coverage, um, but you should get the coverage because the coverage, um, you know, you, you, you at some point, whether you realize it or not, you've either been hacked or you're going to be hacked. <laughs> and so it is important to try to get some cyber coverage. But what's also fascinating, and this is a little bit off topic, but when that attack I mentioned, we call it, the name is a, is a formal name. It was called the NotPetya attack, that 2017 attack that Russia did to Ukraine that boomeranged around to some yeah. of the companies I mentioned. Um, when Merck and Mondelez, the snack maker, whose systems were also decimated, claim, put in their claims uh, to get coverage back from their cyber insurance policies, Zurich Insurance and others said, uh-uh, this was an act of war and there is a exemption in your policy for an act of war and we don't have to cover for this <laughs> so those claims are still being fought in court um, and it's interesting because at what point you know we're seeing so many nation states see that they can target not uh, american government agencies necessarily but american businesses um, and that that's really our sweet spot is the economy we saw you know a couple of years ago iran was nailing American banks with denial of service attacks that just made it impossible for you to do online banking. And the banks were suffering the cost of those attacks. Um, is that an act of war? Because it's, it's coming from Iran and it was partly in retaliation for the Stuxnet attack. You know, it gets very complicated. And, and so I think that's gonna be a really fascinating area for the next few years. Um, I the last question that just came up that reminded me from Elise Cook, um, but I, I, I'm going to dovetail on her question, which was, um, have you, and, and this will be our last question, but have you, um, did you do anything before you were a writer? Is journalism where you started? Have you always been a writer? And, and in that vein, I'm kind of curious, you know, as a writer, you know, who, what influenced you to take the route that you took and 
do you mm. see yourself writing something different or different beat or different uh, venues down the road? Thank you for this question. No one's asked me this yet. And um, I took a very circuitous, circuitous path into writing. I always enjoyed writing. Um, that's, that's, that was my flow, you know, was when I would be writing, but I never wrote for a school paper. It was always, you know, for a term paper or my diary or something. Um, and I went to Princeton and after Princeton, I took all the jobs that Princeton people, um, end up doing for whatever reason. I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked as a consultant for the insurance industry. That's why I find it so boring. Um, <laughs> and I worked in marketing at coach, the handbag leather company and each job was just, oh, and I was a paralegal and each job was just more mind numbingly boring than the last to me. And I realized it's because I missed the creative and intellectual challenge of writing. And I found myself a lot of days, you know, wasting my employer's time because I was reading, you know, New Yorker articles at work and that kind of thing. So even though I'd gone to Princeton, I um, was living in New York and I signed up for this adult continuing studies class at NYU at night. Mm -hmm. And I would go and I would just engage in these writing exercises. And the guy who taught the class was actually a columnist at the New York Post of all places. And he pulled me aside and he said, Nicole, I think you have something here. I think you might want to try journalism. Um, have you ever thought about it? And I really had. And I had just taken the class simply because I missed writing. And so he said, okay. Yesterday, there was this big discovery of these rats in the back of a Taco Bell KFC in the West Village. Literally, camera crews had gone and there were like rats doing cartwheels in the back of the <laughs> So he's like, could you do a story on some nice restaurants in Manhattan that have rat problems too, you know, to explain that this is not just a Taco Bell problem. So I was like, okay. So after work, I started going through the Department of Health records and, and looking through these restaurant reports. And long story short, I find this abysmal uh, health record for this restaurant um, in Chelsea. And I had just eaten there and it was like a delightful restaurant. I don't remember any rat problems. Mm -hmm. So I went to, I went and stopped by and I said, I'm looking at your health report and it looks really horrible. It says you have cockroaches and rat poop everywhere. <laughs> I didn't think that this was the case. Like, what was this all about? And they said, oh my God, the guy came, the health inspector came. He uh, got drunk at our bar. He passed out on the bar and then to explain to his supervisor why it took him two, three hours to do the inspection, he, he failed us on everything and we actually have footage of it. So I went back to the New York Post and I said, I'm sorry, I cannot do the assignment that you gave me, but here's footage of this guy, you know, passed out on a bar while he was supposed to be doing this health inspect in inspection. And New York Post like laughed in my face and they were like, are you kidding? They put it on the front page of the um, Sunday New York Post, which if you read the New York Post, you know, they're famous for their headlines. And mm -hmm. it said, rat nap, inspector snoozo. And it was on the Sunday front page of the New York Post. And I had never had a byline before. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. I went out to the bodega and bought, you know, every New York Post in their, in their <laughs> stack. And that got me hooked. And so after that, I went into a journalism program at Stanford that was this short nine month program. And they're actually, it's, it's really this orphan program at Stanford. It has a Stanford name, but no one even knows it exists. And I liked it because you could take classes at the other schools. So I took classes at the business school and I thought maybe business journalism um, and covering technology would allow me to stay in Silicon Valley where I'm from the Bay area. Mm -hmm. And also it seems so competitive to try and cover politics and arts and all these things that sounded really interesting. Maybe I could cover technology for a while or, or the business of technology and see where that goes. And so that's what happened is uh, I took some internships at Forbes um, that became a job. And then the New York times it happened quicker than I thought. Um, yeah. But what was the second part of the question? Well, oh, the different part, beats. Yeah. Do you see yourself yeah. doing other things down the road? Yeah. I mean, this book is really my magnum opus. <laughs> it's everything I've learned from the last 10 years. I hope it's my sort of own they call it left of boom um, when you get intelligence that you can get left of the attack. Mm -hmm. I hope that this is my own sort of left of boom um, contribution, but it really is everything I've learned over the last 10 years for the lay reader. And now it's time to, I think, move on. Um, so it's covering cybersecurity, like I said, is really hard. Yeah. And it's, it's a, a hypercritical community. It's a male dominated community. 
and it's just rough out there. And so I don't know what I want to cover next. Part of me just wants to step back and cover the quirkier elements of our digital um, lives. And, uh, you know, some of my favorite stories I did were things like uh, I discovered, you know, the, I went out to Wisconsin to this uh, uh, well, mom and pop welder. Um, and they had been told that there were Chinese hack- military hackers in their backroom server. And they're like these mom and pop welders in the middle of these horse pastures <laughs> outside Madison. And so I went and told the story of, you know, the moment they found out that the Chinese military was living in their back office. And instead of sort of ripping the server out of the wall, they gave access to this security firm that could put a sensor on their server and block attacks from, from their back office server. So I love doing that, you know, bringing yeah. people to the physical space and telling it through these human stories. So I think I'll keep doing that. Um, but maybe not stick with the news cycle because it's exhausting. <laughs> I, I can understand. Well, this has been extremely fascinating and a wonderful conversation. And I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. I'm going to hold up your book um, and encourage everyone. Uh, we'll pop the link in one more time into the chat. Um, so if you want to click on the link and get a copy of the book, please do so. And Nicole Pearl Roth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Thank you, everyone, for joining.